this Editiocritica Mile session at the Society of Biblical Literature annual meeting aims to communicate information about the progress of this edition to a more general audience, as well as to the committee members of the International Greek New Testament Project. I'm Hugh Houghton from the University of Birmingham, and as the IGNTP's executive editor for the Pauline Epistles, I shall provide an overview of the ongoing work, along with an update for the specific epistles for which I have responsibility. Although the official title of my paper is simply Progress on the ECM of Paul, it might have been more descriptive to call it Fresh Identifications Among Greek Manuscripts of the Pauline Epistles and a New Apparatus of Galatians. I shall inform you about manuscripts which have very recently been selected for the inclusion in the Editio Critica Maior, along with two important developments with regard to the edition of Galatians, the formal appointment of the editorial board and the online publication of the initial apparatus which provides the complete textual information for over 200 Greek manuscripts. The IGNTP took on formal responsibility for the Pauline Epistles in 2017, and since then it has appointed a series of co-editors. We at ITSI in Birmingham have taken responsibility for the first six epistles, although Christina Kleinecker at KU Leuven is now leading work on 1 Corinthians as part of a project which she will introduce in the next paper. Colossians is being transcribed at Abilene Christian University under the direction of Kurt Nickham, to whom we send our best wishes for his recovery. The two Thessalonian epistles are being led by Ekaterini Tsalabuni, and the pastoral epistles by Andrew Smith, and they will each be presenting an update on their work later in this session. Transcriptions of Philemon are being prepared informally by Grant Edwards and Matt Solomon. Finally, it has been agreed that Martin Caller's team at the Institute for Septuagint and Biblical Textual Research in Bupatal, who are currently working on the ECM of Revelation, will turn after that to the Epistle to the Hebrews. So progress is underway in all 14 letters of the corpus. The webpage with links to the resources which are currently available can be found at www.epistuli.org. I would like to take this opportunity to offer thanks to the organizations which have funded this work, including the British Academy and the European Research Council. A number of the transcriptions have been contributed by trained volunteers from across the world, as well as a team of students at Birmingham all overseen by my colleague Amy Mishlal, the IGNTP's transcription coordinator. Many thanks to all the transcribers, and especially to Amy, who does a remarkable job, as you'll see on the next slide. I report twice a year on our progress to the IGNTP committee, and here you see the total number of transcriptions for the first six epistles. The smaller figures in brackets represent the change since my last report in May 2021 as the transcriptions move through the different stages from right to left. So on the top line, you'll see that we have now published online 97 proofread transcriptions of Romans, 29 of those in the last six months. At the current rate of progress, it's therefore possible that all the transcriptions will be published by this time next year. The process is already complete for Galatians and Ephesians, and excellent progress is being made with Philippians. Transcribers are now pressing ahead with the Corinthian correspondence. And by the way, if you're concerned about the discrepancies between the numbers of published manuscripts and the total selection, there are several reasons for this. Not only have the criteria for selection evolved during the period of transcribing, but in the case of fragments, we made a transcription first in order to evaluate the text. And even if that manuscript is not eventually included in the ECM, we don't want this work to go to waste, so the transcription has been published online along with the others. Two years ago, in the Festschrift for Klaus Wachtel, I published the initial selection of the manuscripts for the ECM of the Pauline Epistles. And this web link, um, tinyurl.com slash paul hyphen select, will take you to the open access version. All papyri are included, along with 14 lectionaries. And the other Greek manuscripts were chosen based on the data from the Text on Textwert series, including nine witnesses, which are representative of the Byzantine text. I developed three criteria to select the manuscripts which would be transcribed in full. 
First, every manuscript which agreed 85% or less with the majority text in an individual epistle was chosen for that epistle. Second, every manuscript which had an overall majority text agreement of 70% or less across the whole Pauline corpus was included for all the epistles. And then third, in order to take account of shifting patterns of affiliation and some relatively small numbers of test passages, if a manuscript had an overall agreement with the majority text between 70 and 85% across the whole corpus, then the threshold for selection for any individual epistle within that corpus was raised to 90%. These criteria resulted in selection of around 140 manuscripts for each epistle with some variation. However, as I noted in my article, there was still more work to be done on selection. 28 manuscripts are not extant in any of the test passages, and 21 are preserved in 10 passages or fewer, so these needed to be re-evaluated on the basis of their broader relationship to the majority text. 40 manuscripts were inaccessible when text on text fact was produced, but images are now available of around half of these. In addition, 24 new manuscripts of Paul have been identified since the publication of Text on Text Vert back in 1991. Six of those have been added to the lister in the past year or so, thanks to the work of my colleagues Georgi Parpolov and Jacopo Markon on the European Research Council Catena project. In order to ensure that the ECM volumes are as up to date as possible, it was therefore necessary to check the readings of the newly available witnesses in each of the test passages. Using indexed images on the New Testament virtual manuscript room made this much easier than the original analysis would have been, although it was still a time consuming process. But we now have text on text fat data for another 36 manuscripts in Romans, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and thanks to the work of my doctoral student Zachary Skarka in Colossians. As one might expect, most of these new witnesses correspond closely to the majority text and so do not match the criteria for selection. But in addition to a few manuscripts which fall under the 85% threshold for individual epistles, there are four manuscripts which have a significant proportion of non-majority readings across multiple epistles. These are as follows. Gregory Allant 1108 is a 12th century manuscript of Acts and Paul held in the Espigmenu Monastery on Mount Athos, which I was able to consult on microfilm in Thessaloniki back in 2018. It's the only one of these four manuscripts which has a majority agreement below 85% in all five epistles that we've so far looked at. GA 2865 is also a 12th century Pax Apostolos which was added to the Lister in 2002 after it was brought to scholarly attention by David Parker and Bruce Morrill following their visits to Harvard's University Houghton Library. This manuscript has a 91% majority agreement in Romans, but in Galatians, Philippians and Colossians, this falls to between 80 and 73%, suggesting the presence of block mixture in the shorter epistles. GA 2936, a Catena manuscript of Paul dated to 1227 or 1228, was brought to light by Dan Wallace and the Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts on their exhibition to the National Library of Greece in Athens in 2015. The manuscript is incomplete, but the latter part of Romans has a majority agreement of 90%, and in Galatians and Philippians, it is 76 and 82%, and Colossians dropping to as low as 60%. The fourth manuscript presents a challenge. It was added to the Lister following its digitization by CSNTM in 2009, when it was given the number GA 2892. The manuscript is a 10th century copy of Acts and Paul, with a majority agreement in Romans of 83%, and Galatians and Ephesians and Colossians all below 80%. But before publishing Aniditio Princeps, we were anxious to establish more of its history. Following the suggestion of Katie Leggett at the INTF that this might be the same manuscript as GA 2853, based on its dimension and aspects of the pagination, a few days ago, I managed to acquire a catalog of the auction at which GA 2853 was sold in 1993. This contains two images and a full description of the manuscript, proving that it is the same as GA 2892. So the later number will now be removed from the lister. 
What we still don't know is how and when it was acquired by the antiquities dealer George Zakos, who died in 1983, but investigations are ongoing. And while these four manuscripts are not as textually important as famous minuscules such as GA 1739 or 1881, further investigation of them may shed light on aspects of the transmission of the Pauline epistles. Revising the selection of manuscripts has also involved the elimination of other witnesses based on the nature of their text. The most striking discovery has been the identification of one manuscript as a copy of a printed edition. Following Martin Kaller's proposal to report details of nomina sacra abbreviations in the ECM of Revelation, we also implemented this in our apparatus of Galatians. It could be of theological interest where the words such as Christos, Pneuma, or Anthropos were treated by copyists as nomina sacra or written in full. But I became suspicious when I observed that GA296 had no abbreviations at all. This is a two volume New Testament copied by Angelo Vegecchio, a distinguished scribe who lived from 1505 to 1569. His handwriting was the model for the Greek characters in the Gallimond font. And as you can see, one of his other manuscripts includes an image of a unicorn. So collating the text of GA296 with the majority text of Robinson and Pierpont gives a list of 11 differences and checking these in a series of 16th century printed editions soon led to a match. 10 of the 11 differences are matched by the Greek New Testament printed in 1534 by Simon de Colline, which is Latinized as Collineus. These include a reading which is unique to GA296 among all the witnesses selected for the ECM, the omission of Ace Christon at Galatians 327. And the sole discrepancy between these two can also be explained by looking at the layout of Colleen's edition. At Galatians 3.5, GA296 inserts N between Epikoregon and Humin. This seems to be an anticipation of N Humin later in the verse. And in the lineation of the printed edition, N Humin occurs immediately below the first Humin. So we could understand quite easily how a copyist would have read Epicorego and then momentarily skipped down to the line below, adding in N before resuming the rest of the line. There are several paratextual features which connect GA296 with Colleen's edition too. They have exactly the same chapter divisions and the same in, um, as subscriptio at the end of the epistle. And there are five sets of marginal inverted commas in Colleen's edition, indicating Paul's Old Testament quotations, all of which are found in the manuscript. So on the right hand page in the blue circles, you can see the two sets of marks which follow the quotation at Galatians 4.27, introduced by the phrase Gigraptigar. But on the left-hand page, in the green circle, unlike other texts, neither Colleen nor GA296 have inverted commas alongside the quotation of Genesis 1615 at Galatians 4.22, even though that is introduced by the same phrase. So this is another factor towards the secure identification of GA296 as a copy of Colleen's edition, which should therefore be excluded from the ECM. After reaching this conclusion, I made further investigations and found that Darius Müller had already demonstrated the same connection between Colleen for Revelation in a 2015 publication in ANTF. So it was therefore likely that the whole manuscript was a copy of Colleen's edition. And a brief examination of the Gospels not only confirmed this, but explained a peculiarity in the titles of this manuscript. As you can see here in Mark, Colleen includes the designation of the first chapter, Kephalion Alpha, as part of the title of the gospel. And I think this explains why in GA 296, the title is copied as the Holy Gospel according to Mark Alpha, number one, or, or possibly even the first gospel according to Mark. So the word for Kephalion has been admitted for chapter, but the numeral is detained, both in Mark and in Matthew, Luke, and John. 
You can also see on this page the writing of the nominus sacra in the first verse in full and quotation marks in the margin, again, matching those in Colleen's edition. So we can now discount this manuscript as a witness to the textual tradition of the Greek New Testament, although it could be an interesting um, study for scribal practice in the 16th century. And we might also note that Colleen's text of Paul differed sufficiently from the majority text that GA 296 was originally selected for inclusion in the ECM of all the epistles, apart from Thessalonians and Hebrews. So that could repay further study. The third and final part of my presentation is to introduce the initial apparatus of the Editio Critica Maior of Galatians. And once again, I should acknowledge the, report, the support of the European Research Council in the creation of this apparatus. So once we had completed the selection and transcription of the Greek manuscripts, the next stage was to produce a collation of these witnesses following the principles of the ECM. The preliminary version was completed at the end of last year, and during the course of 2021, this was examined by the other general editor of the Pauline Epistles, Holger Schlutwolf, and his colleagues at INTF. Following Holger's approval in September, we were then able to move to the signing of a contract with the German Bible Society to take formal responsibility for the delivery of the ECM of Galatians. The editorial board for Galatians will consist of myself as lead editor, my Birmingham colleagues Amy Mishel and Catherine Smith, who have done so much already to enable us to get to this point. Christina Kleinecker from Leuven, and Marie Louise Lackmann, Greg Paulson, and Holger Schlutwolf from Münster. The remaining tasks are to establish the editorial text through applying the coherence-based genealogical method, to add the versional and patristic information, and to prepare the volume for publication initially as a separate fascicle. Having revised the initial apparatus, we've now made it available online, like the apparatus for ECM John, so it can be consulted by all who are interested. The apparatus is accessible through the same website as the transcriptions, and there is some initial documentation detailing the processes involved in constructing the apparatus, the manuscripts included, and then um, the conventions of presentation, before the links to a negative apparatus and the full positive apparatus, which includes all agreements with the base text. So if we click on negative apparatus, that opens in a new window. The chapter and the verse are selected by drop-down menus, and you can navigate with the previous and next buttons. The base text for this collation is that of Nestle Island 28, which is the starting point for the ECM. I should emphasize this is not the new Ausgangs text. That's a task which still awaits us. And then the variants in the window below are labeled following the ECM practice. So we have readings or subreadings, which are identified as errors, phelan with the F suffix, and um, orthographic alternatives with an O. And the suffixes to the manuscript sigla correspond to the standard ECM forms. So there's an asterisk for a first hand reading, um, there's a C or C2 for the collector reading. Um, and then there are R's for readings which have been regularized. And if we wanted to find anything more out about the manuscripts which have been regularized, all of these sigla are hyperlinks. So we could click on any one of those and the full transcription will appear in a new window and we can investigate the original spelling, the format and so on. So even though we are at least two years away from the publication of the edition, we hope this will be a useful resource in the meanwhile and will also enable any issues to be brought to our attention and resolved before we proceed to print. In the time that remains, I have a few more slides with some preliminary information about the apparatus and the manuscripts it includes, and a final piece of good news. In total, we have 202 Greek manuscripts in the edition, including the selected lectionaries and Byzantine witnesses. And over the 151 verses of Galatians, that's including the inscriptio and subscriptio, the negative apparatus has 1,336 variation units and a total of 2,353 variant readings. For comparison, NA28 has 134 variation units in Galatians with 308 variants. So the Editio Critica Maior will supply around 10 times more information. And while that may appear an impressive figure, in practice, the picture is actually far more consistent. As this graph shows, 
1,171 variants, which is exactly half the total, are only attested by a single Greek witness. And 371 are present in just two witnesses. So um, this, this large area at the end, I, I shall expand to show how few um, variants we have attested by larger numbers of witnesses. Um, you can see 78% of all the variants are restricted to four witnesses or fewer. 88% are found in fewer than 10 witnesses. And then at the other end of the scale, 128 variants are tested by 30 witnesses or more, 86 variants by 70 or more, and 68 by the majority of the manuscripts in the collation. And those figures confirm the relationship between Nestle, Nestle text and the majority text. All of these 68 most attested readings correspond to the editorial text of the 2005 Robinson Pierpont edition. And that edition has eight other differences from Nestle 28, excluding orthographic variants. And all 76 of these variants qualify as Byzantine readings based on our selection of representative Byzantine manuscripts. The best witnesses to the Byzantine text are GA35 and GA2352, and they differ from that Byzantine standard by just two and three readings, respectively. Looking at the manuscripts in terms of their agreement with the text of NA28, the closest substantial witnesses are the major majuscules, as might be expected. Codex Vaticanus has 43 variants. Um, Codex Alexandrinus has 52, just after Ephraim the Scriptus with 51. And there's um, Codex Sinaiticus with 71 variants. At the other end of the scale, the so-called Western majuscules all appear among these eight most variant witnesses. Codex Claramontanus has 167 differences. There's Codex Boenerianus with 186. And, and second most different of the whole corpus is Codex Algiensis with 194. Four of these last eight are Catena manuscripts, two of Theophylact and two with extracts from Chrysostom. And that's something I'll be looking into more closely in the coming months. The most variant manuscript is GA 1918 with 195 differences. This is a 14th century manuscript of Revelation and Paul held by the Vatican Library. And it was intended to be a bilingual document, but the Latin text is only extant in Revelation, as you see in the top left. For the whole of the Pauline corpus, the left-hand column is left blank. In Galatians, it clearly derives from the Byzantine text. It has 57 of the 76 distinctive readings. And this is also the manuscript with the highest number of singular readings in our collation. Its total of 38 is just above that of P46, which has 36 singular readings. But looking through the other variants, suggests that many of these are changes in word order or orthographic interchanges, such as epsilon for upsilon or um, alpha iota in place of epsilon. So it's so that eta than upsilon, isn't it? And, and um, alpha iota there. They still make sense in context, so they've been retained in the apparatus, but they are of very limited significance. There's one other development which I would like to mention today, which will also contribute to the ECM of Galatians. Last Friday, it was announced that funding has been awarded to a new Anglo-German project on the early versions of the Pauline epistles with the acronym GALAXY, which covers the languages involved. It's led by myself, Olga Schlutwolf in Münster and Frank Feder in Göttingen. And this three-year project starting in February will produce the Vetus Latina edition of Galatians and digital transcriptions of the early Coptic witnesses for Galatians and Ephesians in the first instance, and other colleagues will be contributing other languages. So to conclude, I'm delighted to have been able to present so much progress on the Editio Critica Mile of Paul. The number of transcriptions continues to grow. We're discovering more about the textual character and significance of certain witnesses, and the online apparatus of Galatians is a major step forward which will help us with this new project working on the versions. As ever, work towards an edition like this presents a variety of new insights and avenues for further research. And I look forward to reporting on these developments in future communications. Thank you very much. <laughs>